Hey, hey, hey. All right. Fran, you are the first president of SAG that is actively addressing sustainability in productions. Why did you decide that this was a major ambition for your tenure? Uh, you know, I came into um, becoming president already an environmentalist. So um, I campaigned talking about the fact that I didn't want sag after to remain Switzerland anymore, but to actually uh, stand up to issues that matter. We're the largest entertainment union in the world, and we have a responsibility to that world. So a big vision of mine, if I were elected, uh, was to start a Green Council, and Green Council um, means eco-responsible entertainment. And part of that is pulling together very high-profile celebrities and NGOs like Emma, who all have their own lane of expertise that are going to be like my advisory board. And, uh, and then, of course, all the major associations and guilds. So it looks like that's all coming together. And then what we want to do is make uh, a uh, industry-wide ban on single-use plastic our first effort on which to build our legacy. That's fantastic. Now, people don't always connect sustainability with health. Uh, was this your way into the movement? I'm a cancer survivor. June, I'll be 22 years well. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I started the Cancer Schmanson movement because I didn't want what happened to me to happen to other people by means of uh, misdiagnosis and mistreatment. It took me two years and eight doctors to get a proper diagnosis of uterine cancer. I got in the stirrups more times than Django. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I wrote the book, Cancer Schmancer, and then realized that my story was not unique. So uh, that was the beginning of what's become a life mission. And the Cancer Schmancer movement was born out of that. And at first, it was the cornerstone was all about early detection, catch it on arrival, 95% survival. Um, but then I began to ask the question, why are we getting sick in the first place? Why is so much of Western medicine reductionist in the sense that it only deals with the end symptom and not causation? Why don't we identify the causation that's making us sick, eliminate it, and not get sick in the first place? How's that for a cure? So um, I started to look at environment because 95% of most dis-ease is stimulated by the toxic environment that we live in. And uh, the uh, Cancer Schmancer movement started to become a very um, environmentally conscious movement. And we didn't really partner so much with other organizations in the health space because they were all looking for the next big chemo and we were partnering with people like um, Environmental Working Group and a Plastic Pollution Coalition and now we're happy to associate ourselves with Emma and it's just, you know, so important that we empower people to uh, transform from being a patient into a medical consumer to understand that how you live equals how you feel and there's really no wiggle room in between between. So what we're buying, what we're bringing into our homes, the home is the most toxic place we spend the most time in and ironically have the most control over. But we're brainwashed into buying things that we see advertised. Well, you know, advertisers at the end of the day really don't want to kill us. They really want to sell us. But they'll sell us anything that we're willing to buy, which right now is anything. So we're you know, <laughs> educating, motivating, and activating consumers to become mindful consumers and dictate more responsible manufacturing trends. That's, that's, that's so great. Absolutely. So, you know, I am on sets quite a bit, as you are, as some of the people that are going to be on our panel are. And 
for many, many years, decades, there's just litter of plastic bottles everywhere. Plastic waste is is uh, the biggest offender, aside from you know paper waste or sides, uh, and it seems like a logical jumping off point. Um, I, I'd love for you to expand why your passion is to focus on single use plastics first uh, with regards to sets and and how you feel like that will uh, ultimately sort of be uh, the jumping off point to the, the full movement of more sustainable sets. Well, I, you know, I'm an ardent believer that when you're um, starting something new, um, you need to go out and get a big win. Otherwise, it's hard to sustain it because it loses momentum. People get disappointed. They feel like, oh, we weren't really successful. So I wanted to uh, leverage something that I felt we can win at because it ticks off all the boxes. Uh, when it comes to plastic, it's you know petroleum, it's oceans, it's air, it's health, it's cancer, it's the soil, it's an open-ended system, you know, you name it. There's nothing good about it, and uh, so um, and yet it seems very doable. It seems scalable. It seems like I wouldn't get a lot of pushback from uh, the big studios and networks. Uh, because um, there are uh, substitutes that we can use. But more important, uh, it's not only ha is what goes on behind the scenes, but really must be what's going on on camera. Because, um, you know, uh, we're one of our uh, sister partners is Plastic Pollution Coalition. They have a new program called Flip the Script. And, uh, you know, Norman Lear's uh, group down at USC analyzed how many times plastic abuse is normalized on camera. And there are party scenes, you can't even count how many pieces of plastic is used. What we have to take the responsibility to do as an industry is to normalize eco-responsible living. That's not what's being done currently. But we have the ways and means to do it if everybody steps up to the plate and understands that we are the greatest influencers on the planet. And if we don't do it, who is going to? We have to come together in a way that hasn't been seen since World War II as an entertainment industry to get out there and literally shift people's thinking so that we can save the planet. That's great. Absolutely, 100%. So, you know, we've had early discussions about this. Um, you know, one of the things that we want to announce today and that, you know, we'll be, we'll be working on throughout the next few months to a year, you know, with Fran and SAG as well, is empowering our actors in a very real way. You know, a, the, a lot of times people say in, in politics and et cetera that, you know, actors shouldn't be talking on things and they, they shouldn't be, you know, they, they should just act, right? W in the entertainment business... No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in the, in the entertainment business, uh, and, and, you know, we know firsthand, I know firsthand, that uh, movies and television don't get made without actors. And actors actually have power uh, that that is 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 premium power, the most power, um, and so we are looking to create and and, and you you see the sign outside, and we've already started working with some of our actors. Uh, the the Emma Talent Writer, which is going to be uh, a wonderful new program where uh, actors will, you know, we're creating a pledge first. The pledge will ultimately become a writer, and the writer will be used in negotiations moving forward. Uh, small things, you know, understanding the studio side with our sustainability directors, you know, the production side vis-a-vis uh, -vis myself and some of the people on the Emma board, uh, and the actor side, you know, working with SAG and, and our actors on our board and, and beyond uh, to create a, a list of things that we can kind of push forward in negotiations when an actor, you know, wants to have a cleaner set and hopefully normalize things, you know, even the smallest things uh, that create impact, like, you know, I always use the example of uh, a single trailer car versus a, uh, 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 you know, 
uh, a two, a two, you know, a, 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 a double banger. A pop out yes. star trailer. Right. Wait yeah. a minute here. <laughs> because you know those little things. What's helpful <laughs> with that is if you go from a single to a two uh -huh. banger, you can spend that money on the producer side. They're happy. They're saving a little bit more. But then the actor can say, Hey, hey, hey if I'm getting rid of that, then you need to have these things on set. You know, and so the sort of give and take here, and we're looking at many more, you know, examples with that, and you know, working. I think that's through. very clever. Yes. You know, to use bargaining in that way, and uh, you know, there. I mean, look, there are uh, uh, some of the people that are uh, on Green Council, like Kate Blanchett, who's very much an environmentalist, and she always tries to get her sets to be uh, green. Um, but um, she said even, you know, she's busy working and she can't police That's every right. single person right. on the set, even though it's in her contract. And, you know, I think that um, besides this, I always feel like each one teach one. And, you know, change begins with you. Be the change you want to see happen. So if every actor... Uh, or, you know, went on the set and brought their own uh, little, you know, uh, plate and cup and, and their own little fork and knife that's all eco-friendly and uh, their own water bottle and stuff like that um, and, and really and ask for uh, scripts to be uh, double-sided if they're not on... Or on a, a tablet. Or on a tablet. Or exactly, yeah, 100%. Uh, you know, you would begin to see a shift in consciousness. Sometimes you may not have the ability to negotiate anything. You really don't have As that you're brought kind of in, and right? You know, which is why standardizing it is is so helpful. So, you know, so what we're going to do, and but and you can still be an influencer on the set, of course, one hundred percent. So yeah, so you know, and and that just just a heads up that will also be in the digital issue of Hollywood Reporter. You'll be able to see the writer there, and hopefully, you know, there's a t there's a press tab there, and and we'll start you know kind of letting you know as it progresses. We'll keep you up to date, uh, you up to date as well as you know we get to awards later on this year and continuing but we are uh, we are trying to be the change at, at Emma as well and we feel like this is something that we can all really win on so we'll keep you posted on that and in the meantime Sorry. we're gonna uh, bring out our our panelists uh, Hart and John uh, for uh, for other elements of this discussion on sustainability and and greening uh, studios guys come on uh, come on out Hi. Hi. You must be friends. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, so let's start with John. Uh, John, from a, from a studio side, how do you get TV and film projects to abide by guidelines? Because, you know, a, a, as many people may not know, there actually are studio guidelines uh, that hopefully many people abide by. But, you know, obviously there's always bad apples. Um, you know, are there studio mandates and, and how do you control them? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Asher. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. So thank you and Debbie. It's wonderful to be on a panel with these two stars. Um, it's panels like this that actually remind me of when all of this work started and the importance of collaboration. And Fran, I know you've talked about it, but the importance of collaboration across the industry, not only to create the compelling content that we produce for audiences worldwide, but to do so in a sustainable way. Fifteen years ago when we started, it took the collaboration to simply define what sustainable production is. And I know Lisa Day is out here somewhere and she'll remember. Um, we worked with Emma and other organizations because no one had a clue what sustainable production meant. And when we say we're sustainable, are we being consistent with one production versus another? Um, and that's really critical um, to make sure that we are being credible with what we're doing in the, in the studio world. Um, so your question, how is the sausage made? I'll, I'll bore you for about 30 seconds because it is kind of dull and boring. We've been an ISO 14001 studio for 23 years. If anybody's interested in management systems, um, happy to talk afterwards. Um, but it requires a very strict process, onboarding and training in the beginning. Um, and that's around these guidelines and these best practices that you're that you mentioned. Yeah, and, and let's just to expand on that. You know, we have been working on the you know the green seal with you guys for so many years. It's a wonderful group. 
Uh, we update it all the time. Can you let everybody know how many guidelines we have at this point? <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few. So go to the Environmental Media Association's um, website for it. You can also go to the Green Production Guide that talks about uh, you know, the, the guidelines as well. They're all named after stone fruits, if anybody likes stone fruits. It's the peach, pear, and plum. Um, and through the process with productions, we make sure that they are not only filling out those forms, but they're actually doing the work. Um, so you have this sort of plan, check, act, do process that again comes from ISO. And that's, what, that's how we handle it from a studio perspective. We have someone on our team, both here in the US, in London, actually in India now as well as of last year, to work with all of our productions to be the experts. What does that look like? Uh, you know, when, let's say I have a production and I've gone through development and now I'm in the pre-production process with my team, right? And is there someone that comes to the production office and goes through our line item budget? How does that work? Yes, they, they, they go through trainings. So we have an online training for the larger group. For the production office, there is a person-to-person -person training. Obviously, everything's virtual now. It allows you to reach a lot more faster. Um, but they're going through, I wouldn't say necessarily the line item budget. We actually go through more things like the green seal checklist and talk about each department and what's the responsibility of each department and what's the expectation of each department. Um, also reaching out to the HODs of each department to make sure that they're understanding. And then making sure they know what the resources are. Again, we have a sustainable production expert on staff that supports all of our production. We have an incredible procurement team that can help them source the, the materials that they need. Um, we Vendors, learn. et cetera. Exactly. Um, we learn from all the productions that came beforehand, not only at Sony, but across all the studios. It's a collaborative effort across, and we work with all the guilds to bring that information back to make sure the great things that one production is doing is also happening on future productions as well. And you see these trends, they, they, they follow. So they do. One, one certain thing happens, and then on, on stages and sets, you start seeing every one person talks about, okay, this is great, We're, we'll do this, in the same way that certain technologies get popularized on, on sets as well. That's right. And, and I will say, during the pandemic, it's been validating. So with everything going on during the pandemic, as we all know on production, it was extra work. It was extra challenging. It was extra stress. With that stress, we actually would get calls from productions that we didn't reach out to because there were so many things going on and saying, where is our sustainable program? We want to do this. Can you guys support us? So it was validating the fact that it's not always a push, but sometimes they're pulling us to do that. And that's because it's validating and they've seen it for so long now that they're, it, that's an expectation. That's great. Hart, as a director on network and cable television projects as well as film, uh, what have you seen are the core differences between production using Emma Green Seal guidelines and a set that does not? Did you just make that up? Very funny. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> well, as I've worked on both sides of the camera, it's um, e each each job sort of entails uh, different, obviously different requirements. When you're directing a movie, be it a studio film or an independent film, of which I've done both. Um, you're dealing with uh, different bureau bureaucracies. You know, when you're doing a studio film, um, basically studios are most concerned with their bottom line. And the trick is, when you're shooting, when you're shooting an independent film, and you're the director, essentially, the director, of producer, writer, you can effectively do whatever you want to do, as long as it doesn't affect the bottom line. As an actor, the most important thing to do is not to get fired. Because you, know, you come in there and, and with, a, with a list of, of demands, and you can rub people the wrong way. I did a series several years ago, and the first thing I did was, when they hired me as an actor, was to come in and say, look, you know, I'm co-chair of this organization, and we're setting up uh, this thing called the Green Seal, and we have certain targets that we want production to hit. And it would be great if you could take a look at this. And I just saw panic in their eyes because, you know, they don't want to deal with, you know, having to go to different vendors for non or for st sustainable uh, wood products, for example. You know, do you, but I, I guess uh, on an ecosystem level, when you're on a production that does have the support of Green Seal, 
right? Mm-hmm. Uh, is there? Do you, what are the th- little things you notice that are different? You know, obviously, waste is going to be a massive difference. Waste but, is a huge. Uh, you know, are there other little things that you know you can talk to uh, that are are emblematic of of a more sustainable set? Well. That's a that's a tough question. Rephrase it for me. <laughs> okay. How about this? So you walk onto a set as an actor. We'll start there. Directing is obviously complicated, as both of you and I know. Right. You have to worry about just being able to get the movie made a lot of times. So sometimes exactly. it is even more complicated than being right. an actor right. in, in certain right. ways. You're an actor. You get hired to a production. The production is Green Seal certified or in the program at a larger studio, mm-hmm. um, what is th- what do the little differences in sustainability look like okay. versus you're on a uh, production that is not sustainable at all and you guys are just trying to make it through? Well, the first thing you see is a tremendous amount of waste. I mean, what drives me nuts as an actor and as a director is when you get the sides every day, when everybody basically that needs sides has a script. So that's a tremendous amount of waste right there that you try to eliminate. When you see, when you see generators going all day long and nobody's in their trailers, and most of the Jennies now are diesel powered, I was, there's a move towards natural gas. I, I run around telling people, hey, are you guys using your trailer? Because it's just, you know, we're pounding out CO2 here and it would be great if we could turn these off and then talking to transpo guys and blah, blah, blah. But it's just a tremendous amount of waste. And, you know, getting people, because, the productions that I've been involved with for the last 45 years, you never see people bring their own re- bottles or, you know, mugs to work. So, you know, there's a... Aside from Francis and Ed Beckley Jr. <laughs> <laughs> They're in a league of their own, yeah. let's face it. Yeah. So, you know, it's... The most important thing is, is when you come to work is to bring your heart with you and to, to be... To, to be aware of what you're doing and what impact you're making. So, Are there, uh, yeah. one last question with this, and then we have to keep moving. Um, uh, are there, on the food side of things, we talked a lot about waste, right? But you talked about health. So, and, and then we'll get into the COVID of it all because we've all experienced sort of the entire misdirection during COVID of things that might have been bad in a lot of different ways. And uh, thankfully, it's, we're sort of out of the fog on that. But with regards to food, do you ever see a difference with crafty, with catering, with a set that is mindful of health versus a set that is not mindful of health? You mean styrofoam versus recycled? No, I mean literally the actual food you're consuming. No, I haven't seen that. Really? Not yet. I mean, I think that's one of the other things that, that we'd love to tackle because, you know, food is health. And as, as you, you are what you eat. That's right. And I think that the more that we can inspire people to understand, especially on the production side, and I'm sure you, you, we work on this with the Green Seal as well, uh, that there are affordable solutions. We talked about it with Walmart, uh, you know, last night. Uh, the, the giving the options, it's so important in so many different ways. It's even important in terms of performance on set. Everybody, you totally. know, having candy bars all day long versus people, you know, having fruit and having, you know, uh, granola and, and things that are healthier. It, it's, it's a better process in general. and People don't look like zombies after, you know, 10, 15 days. Yeah, I mean, ideally it would be great if we can uh, get out of industrial farming altogether because that's completely screwed up our food supply with agrochemicals. It's not serving the planet well and it's not serving the consumer well at all. And so, uh, you know, whatever productions I'm on, uh, if I'm an executive producer on it, I try and have organic food and, you know, it, and not community things where people are sticking their hand in, nothing like that, um, you know. And, and, and it doesn't need to be a million things. It, needs, it could be, you know, just a selection of four or six things that are high quality and organic and that's not going to put everybody to sleep after the Agreed. lunch break. You also, want, you also want your crew to be happy and you're dealing with so many different kinds of personalities and you don't want them, you know, I want them to be healthy. The powers that be. What's that? <laughs> I want them to be healthy. I want them to be healthy, yeah. <laughs> but, so I think, you know, I think your question about what does it look like 
when you go on production, you see a, a green seal production or a non-green seal production. In some ways, I love the fact that a, a director might go in there and be like, I don't see any different. Because honestly, as a studio, we want the director to create great content. That should be their focus. Right. It should be the rest of the crew's focus and our focus to help support. So catering, fresh, fresh, fresh service, fresh um, plant-based protein. So you have an option to have a full meal with a plant from, from the ground, from plants. Um, compost. Next to that, you'll see a compost. Like if you, if you go to craft services and you see those things, you'll get a sense of what probably exists across the rest of the production. Trailers. Are there solars on the roof? Solar panels on the roof? There's all, not everywhere. We continue to try to push more and more availability to solar trailers. But they're out there, and a lot of the studios and a lot of the shows are using them. You may not see them from the ground, but if you see those things over at craft services, there's a very good chance those are existing out in base camp. Um, and it's those type of things, if you're really looking, will indicate the green seal, seal versus not. But we do love the fact that if you ask a director, if they care about it, they'll know. But we want them to create great content. That's, that's critical for us to be able to go to that next show and doing the same thing. That's great. Um, so you know, I've been on several sets in the last few years, and COVID has been uh, quite a hurdle, as I'm sure you guys are aware. Uh, what, what can we do? Let's see what, what I wrote here. Uh, <laughs> what can we do to move forward with sustainable practices? Yeah. So, you know, in the post-COVID world, uh, you know, where, and, and I know that, that you are obviously working, you know, every day to figure out how to slowly move away from certain things that we had to do to keep everyone safe uh, for the last two years. But, you know, in this world of PCRs, which are obviously very wasteful, um, and certain safety measures, which, thank God, some of them have gone away because, you know, I remember uh, when they were fogging up trailers with chemicals at the beginning of COVID, that definitely did not seem like the healthiest route of, of, of things just to pump toxins and clean things. Um, you know, how do we move forward with all of the gifts that we understand as people with regards to sustainability, reducing single-use plastic, you know, you know, putting all the right measures in while still being conscious of the fact that there is still a virus, it is still infecting people, certain people react really badly to it, and we need to keep our sets safe. Well, first of all, I think that, you know, I, I personally think that it's important that we stay in step with the rest of the world and not create a bubble for ourselves which, where it becomes unrealistic while everybody is out there going to restaurants, going to sporting events, and then they come into the set to a whole different uh, a group of restrictions that sometimes uh, put some people on the outside of, of uh, their capability of working. Uh, but, um, you know, we had to be taught to be a throwaway society. There was a time when, uh, you know, everything was repurposed. Nobody would throw things away. And that kind of started around the time of the invention of the vending machine. Uh, because they would have a coffee machine in the hallway at the office, and it was such a great thing, but then nobody knew what to do with the cup because it was still a perfectly good cup. Um, and we had to actually be taught that it was very modern to just throw the cup away, and then they would have a, a you know, a, a trash receptacle next to the vending machine. And from that point forward, you know, we've kind of gone downhill. I think that, you know, if I had my uh, a show, uh, I, I really don't have a problem with uh, buying uh, dishes and glasses and getting a dishwasher and uh, not doing throwaway, but, you know, everything old is new again. There, I mean, studios provide uh, sets with all, with props and, you know, furnishings and wardrobe, costumes. Well, uh, why not, you know, flatware and dinnerware and glasses and, and mugs and, and just, you know, get used to that we repurpose these things and it's, we stop being so throwaway. That's, that's I, I see that. I, by I the way, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I see that more and more now on sets. That, I mean, there's this ugly reality 
that's uh, going to is starting to affect all of us, which is is water conservation and how, you know what's the what's the right way to go there? You know, if, if we're limited to the amount of water that each person can use a day, which is going to be something like 80 gallons, is is that? But are you saying that it, it's so washing dishes isn't a solution, or? Well, c water conservation has to be something that we pay close attention right, to. Right, but I think it's but, hidden water but I, I think, that's I the think problem. It takes a 1,000 cups of water to make one cup of Starbucks coffee. Right. right. From seed to right. store. Yeah. And that's what, what we have to really be looking and at. And almonds, yeah. You know, wa you make an initial investment of you buy, you know, like uh, dishware, and then you put somebody to work who's a dishwasher, yeah. and uh, you know you keep reusing it. I don't know. It seems like it may help a lot of yeah. problems, like constantly rebuying stuff and constantly throwing away. I mean, no people question. don't realize every single piece piece of plastic that has ever been produced since plastic was invented in the early 20th century is still with us. We can't get rid of it. And each and every one of us consume, on average, a credit card worth of plastic every single week because of microplastic that's everywhere, in the food we eat, in the water we breathe, uh, you know, in, in uh, placenta. It's everywhere. And it's completely invasive and, and ruining our lives in the ocean. Yeah. Great. I, I think we could skip this one because we, we kind of have went over it. And, uh, okay, we have one more question before we open this up to the audience. Uh, and, and this one, I think, starts with John and then works our way through, but it's more of a moonshot question. Uh, what can we look forward to in the future with regards to sustainability? So, and, and let me preface this by saying that, you know, just sort of, sort of put a bow on what we were just talking about. Um, you know, in the last two plus years now, I guess two and a half, uh, we've seen a lot of industries um, refine, take this time to uh, be more efficient, everything from large you know, city structures to uh, large corporations, looking at their bottom line, looking at their CSR, really trying to understand how their systems can be more efficient with sustainability and beyond. And um, I would imagine that, that you guys have also kind of gotten in the tent for the last couple years and started to trend spot what you can do moving forward. Yeah, I think, I think on the sustainability side, sort of three things. One is net zero, right? We'll start seeing that more and more. We have a net zero 2030, scope one, scope two, 2040, scope three um, collaboration. I think the enhancement of our overall industry collaboration is critical to moving us forward. Studios, the guilds, the unions, the vendors, um, bringing everybody together and continuing to have these important conversations and pinpoint those solutions and make progress on them. I think the thing we're also excited about is uh, the, the virtual production. I was literally just going to ask you about virtual production <laughs> and, and how, that, how the carbon footprint will produce so heavily with regards to set design, et cetera. I, th I think that- We should explain what virtual production is to these people out here. Go for it. Are you, no? Y you're the entertainment person. I'm the sustainability so, guy, so. I don't <laughs> know how many of you people, I, everyone uses Mandalorian as the, yeah. the sort of gold standard, so I don't know how many people have watched the Mandalorian, but essentially virtual production is not just a standard green screen. It is a uh, top to bottom and ground um, virtual version of reality, essentially. And instead of it just being green, you can actually create a world. It's sort of a new version of the old school Hollywood backdrops, and it will, uh, from what I gather, it will reduce uh, construction probably by 30 to 40 percent, I would imagine. Is that correct? Yeah, the way I relate it to it is the, the old data center world. If you remember the day and age where everybody had their data server in their closet, even at home, we had a server in our closet. That's inefficient. That's for the most part wasteful from a mechanical standpoint, but also just hard to control from an efficiency standpoint when you have millions of them dispersed. They brought that all into one place. We're going to the cloud. They've created standards and efficiency around that box. Production in the same way. Typically production, if you take Mandalorian, all of those scenes that were all over the place, people would be traveling a lot to different places. That stretches your supply chain out. That makes it really hard to be sustainable 
not in one location, but in 30 locations. And building the idea of building, mm -hmm. you know, uh, giant world Lord of the Rings style as That's well. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And it brings it into one place in a controlled environment. Um, and that brings a lot of opportunities from a creative perspective, but also a lot of, hopefully, benefits from a sustainability perspective. Yeah. Uh, and, and do you have any idea what that, you know, when... How soon that will really, I know it's spreading everywhere. I hear it all the time. Hey, we have a virtual production set, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. How soon that will be uh, sort of at critical mass and, and how much uh, reduction in carbon footprint between travel and, and uh, construction that that will, will help? We are doing the analysis right now on that second part. Um, you know, there's, there's universities out there. I think Greenwich University over in the UK that has a, a working group around this issue as well. Um, to make sure that we are discussing these things in the early evolution of, of virtual production and not in the midterm or later term where it's hard to then evolve. Uh, on the adoption side of things, I'm not the expert on I mean, that. I could tell you I, right now from what I've heard that everybody wants to adopt to it. I mean, even from a filmmaking perspective, the, the idea that you could – for the, the example that people say a lot to me is about cars. This is – the biggest thing is that you can do full car chases – that you can do outside the car, that you can make the car look like it's twisting and turning on roads and all this crazy stuff and have it literally be the size of this room with just, uh, you know, it, it, which is remarkable. If you think about it, Hart, you've been doing this for <laughs> decades and decades. If you could imagine, you know, going, going to... Decades and decades. I'm old. <laughs> uh, if you could imagine going backwards and saying, hey, you don't, and I know how much you like to stay at home too, so here's the other part. <laughs> Uh, hey, you just need to dri <laughs> drive drive uh, 35 minutes, go to the set, and you can do a wild car, car chase, and you'll be done in five hours. I, I mean, I'm doing a wild car chase in my mind right now. That's <laughs> plenty. So. But thanks for joining us. Yes. Uh, so great. I think that's that's that. We're gonna open it up to some questions right now. I'm sure some people have questions. And uh, um, yes, you have no, a question. I right. not really, but there's one over there. Oh, where? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and also, well, I'll say the first step is signing the rider, uh, the pledge, as we are ha ex explaining for everyone to, and, and, and posting it and, and telling people because, you know, we really do believe and we are personally impacted every day, uh, Fran probably a little less than, than the rest of us, by an actor saying, as Fran is not, it would, might be the actor in this situation, as an actor saying, um, hey, I don't want to do that, and you have to do this thing instead. You know, whether it be hair and makeup or a line of, of a script, if we could have those actors to have the same sort of emphatic energy towards, uh, for example, having no, uh, you know, no uh, single use, but instead saying, I want, like you had mentioned before, uh, ceramics and flatware on set, and that is, that is the most important thing to me. And that is really what we are trying to get, get across. And I think it does need to start also on the social media side of things. But I will let John, I think specifically, before Hart chimes in, uh, talk about the corporate element of it. Sure. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think it's important for corporations to take responsibility. At Sony, we do. Um, you can look at our disclosures for the last decade plus. Um, it's, it's our our plan that we established in 2010 called Road to Zero at that point was tied to the, the science that comes out of the UN and later on the Paris Agreement, what we refer to now. It was adopted by a science-based targets initiative, which is a group of NGOs that make sure that the company's plans are aligned with the science. 
We got that improved in 2014 based upon the current science. 2.0 Celsius at that point in time. Science improved. We got that re-approved in 2018, I believe, against the 1.5 cel Celsius initiative. Um, and then we've just declared we're doing net zero for 2040 based upon the new science, because almost very similar to what happened with the pandemic, science evolves. We need to make sure we're evolving with that science, and we're, and we're very much, as a company that's steeped in technology, believe in both the science and trusting the scientists to help guide us on that strategic plan of sustainability. So um, we're on that path based upon that direction. Anything else that you want to chime in with? Yeah, I, I wanted to just add that, you know, to your point, I think it grows from the inside out. The idea of inspiring and educating the masses, but first you have to go to the industry that you're dealing with and say, if we do this, this, and this, this will be the positive effect of that. And, you know, I can speak for Debbie in saying that for the last 20 plus years, we've had, for example, this tremendous relationship with Toyota and getting this massive car company, this institution, to become more environmentally responsible. I, I don't want to say it was an easy task, but I found, I found that we could, we could go to people in the industry and inspire them by saying, you know, Jewish guilt. Jewish guilt. No, do you, do you love your children? So, no, it, but it goes to that. I, I've, always, I've always used that as, as a way to get people to kind of pay attention, which is what kind of life, what kind of world do you want to leave to your children? And by buying a car that is a gas guzzler, where the novelty of ownership is going to rub off after two or three months anyway, and you're stuck with a big payment, to make a car like the Prius cool, which on you know, presentation doesn't seem like a status symbol, but to make it the sort of anti-status symbol. And we grew that with Emma and this ter tremendous relationship. We grew that into making that a viable alternative for people looking to be cool. It became a cool thing to do. And I think, you know, as far as educating multinationals, it's about, it's about bottom line. And Toyota knew that it was going to take, what, 10 years before they would see profit on the Prius. They were losing money on each of them. The first iteration of the Prius, I think, were in excess of $100,000, $150,000 a car. But they saw that if they could get this thing going, it would have a positive effect across the board. That's great. Uh, we have time for one more question, and then I want to do closing thoughts. Anyone? Or not? Okay. Cool. Um, oh, do we have anything right now? Okay. Uh, all right. So, yeah. So, uh, just closing remarks from you guys um, about sort of, uh, you know, what you feel like your personal missions are moving forward in this arena, uh, not necessarily you know, your company or, you know, project or organization, but your personal mission in, in making an impact and sustainability in the entertainment business moving forward. Yeah, uh, well, I'll you go first. Um, I, you know, I, I just feel like um, everybody can control themselves. And that's a very triumphant thing because from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed and everything you buy and everything you put in your mouth, all of your personal care items, everything is a decision that you make. Whether or not you're going to choose to honor your body and honor the planet or whether you're going to kind of throw it off in the back of your head, which is what I think is you know, fatally wrong with our species is that we don't think down the road how our actions are going to impact us and seven generations from now. So um, we have to make that shift. And as individuals, we need to do it. And, uh, you know, I think that we need to um, also really think about where is our money going? What is in your portfolios? Are you investing in big business polluters? Are you, where, what bank is your money in? Chase is the worst bank for investing money in big business polluters. That's how pervasive it is. You can recycle all you want, but if you're keeping your money at Chase, 
all of the money at Chase is supporting big business polluters. So this is the scale that you have to start thinking on. And when we talk about celebrities that are taking, you know, are, are being spokespersons for, uh, you know, also polluters, uh, you know, you, you got to walk away from that sometimes. I, I was asked to do a Kentucky Fried Chicken commercial. It was a ton of money they wanted to give me. Um, and uh, seven figures. And I turned it down. I would have liked the money, believe me. You know, but I'm not going to sell freaking Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> because I have to, you know, walk the talk. And we all have to do that. And if we all did it. If everybody just was responsible for themselves, but they walked the talk and did it the right way, the world would be different because only 10% of the planet needs to change their thinking to actually have a seismic shift in culture. Bravo. For me, I think, I think Fran said it. I think, let's not think about today, let's think about tomorrow. And let's do that in everything we do, from individual decisions to, I know it's personal, but on the work side, to infrastructure. How are we thinking about the infrastructure we create today? And you can think about that in knowledge infrastructure and physical infrastructure. What we create today is going to be around for a long time. So do it smart, do it sustainable, do it healthy. Um, and I think that mindset is really critical to start. If you haven't started already, start now. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I look at the next generation and I don't want to say that there's a sense of futility, but there's certainly grave concern about how we're living our lives and what we're leaving to them. So on a daily basis, I'm try I've been trying to conserve since I was a kid. <laughs> it's just a thing that I was concerned about, about overpopulation, pollution, limited resources, degradation of, of the planet in general. And, you know, if we're going to act now is the time. And, you know, at time is, is certainly, you know, not on our side. So. Well, it was an uplifting way to end it. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyways, thank you guys so much for, uh, for, for being here. Thank and, you so and, much. And uh, let's get ready for our next uh, panel. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.